Hello everyone. Welcome to this webinar. This is my first webinar on YouTube. Uh, it's scheduled to start at 10.05. Uh, that's just two minutes from now. So uh, let's give a couple of minutes for more people to join and then we'll get started. Okay, it's 10.05 and the uh, webinar is scheduled to start now. Uh, so let's get started. I have a PPT. That's going to be the first half of this webinar. Uh, the second half is going to be a hands-on demo on how to use Lightroom Classic. Uh, in between, I will be pausing for questions. So if you have questions, you can type away in the chat window. I will scroll up and see your questions. Uh, I might skip a few questions, but that's uh, that's fine. I will take a few important ones in the, impo in, in the interest of time. Um, so we'll give a minute and then we will get started with the PPT part. All right, on with the PPT. How to edit photos in Lightroom Classic. First, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Pratap and I've been shooting since uh, 2006. Uh, I am mostly an outdoor photographer. I love shooting landscapes, astro, nature, macro, etc. And I post my photos on pratapj.com. I'm also active on uh, social media. Pixel Shooter is my handle. I conduct uh, workshops both in the field and in the classroom. So I've been conducting Lightroom workshops in the classroom for about uh, six years now here in Bangalore. Uh, I also take uh, photographers out in the field and conduct workshops. Uh, so uh, my most popular workshop is the Waterfalls of the Western Ghats workshop, which happens uh, during the monsoon season in Karnataka. So if you're interested in joining any of my workshops, uh, follow me on my social media handle where I announce upcoming workshops and tours. My next free webinar on YouTube is about astrophotography. So if you're interested in astrophotography and you want to know how to get started, uh, watch out for this webinar. So it's good to subscribe and uh, hit the bell icon so you get notified when I set up the schedule for this uh, webinar.
So what is the scope of this webinar? Let's take a look at that. We're going to talk about the basics of image editing. And when I say basics, I'm going to start from the very basic. And this is primarily because uh, we have a varied audience. And then we will move on to Lightroom Classic. Now there are actually three different versions, versions of Lightroom. Lightroom Classic is one of it and Lightroom Classic works on your desktop. So there's also a mobile version of Lightroom. We won't be looking at that. And there's another lighter version of Lightroom, which uh, syncs easily with the mobile version. We won't be looking at that either. And in Lightroom Classic, we will look at how to import photos, organize photos, edit them, and export them. So there's going to be a hands-on demo of Lightroom Classic in the second half of this webinar. Before we get started with uh, talking about the nitty gritties of image editing, let's first look at what is photo editing and what is photo manipulation. So I'm going to take an example here. This is the before and after of a photo that I shot in Gokarna. So the before is obviously uh, very dark and the subject is not uh, very clear. But uh, in the after photo, you can see that I have brightened up uh, the image. I've um, added some saturation, contrast, etc. So basically, this is an image that I have edited. The next before and after uh, shows something which was not there when I shot this photo, which was added much later. And that is the rainbow. And this is what I call photo manipulation, where you add something which was not there uh, in the scene when you took the photo. Now, I'm not making any judgments of whether this is right or wrong, good or bad. Uh, photographers have been known to add and remove stuff ever since uh, Photoshop became a thing. Uh, it's just that we won't be looking at photo manipulation in this uh, workshop. We will be looking at photo editing. The next important concept to know is RAW versus JPEG. So what's the difference between a RAW file format and what's a JPEG file format? So uh, JPEG is the most popular file format because it is widely accepted by websites, email clients, mobile phones, and image viewing software. RAW is a very uh, specific kind of file format. It is produced by uh, mostly DSLR or mirrorless cameras. And the main purpose of shooting in RAW is to be able to edit the photo further in a computer. Now, if you have never explored the settings of your camera, please go do so now because you will see that there is an option to shoot in RAW. If you've been shooting JPEG all along, then it's fine. You can also shoot both RAW and JPEG. So your camera can output both RAW and JPEG at the same time. Or if you are someone who uh, enjoys editing photos later, you can shoot only in RAW. But what are the main differences between RAW and JPEG file formats? So I have this table where I've highlighted some of the differences. Let's go over them. So the, the sole purpose of a RAW file is for image editing and it gives the best quality after editing. So uh, if you have good, if, you, if your final goal is to produce a good quality image, then please shoot in RAW. Whereas a JPEG file is uh, more about compatibility. It's for viewing, sharing, printing, etc. Now the advantage of a RAW file is that it contains all the data which your image sensor captured. And it, it contains all the data which was not processed by your camera. Whereas a JPEG file is actually processed in camera and uh, what you get is something which your camera has processed uh, depending on the kind of preset that you have set your camera to. And uh, JPEG files have an advantage that they are widely compatible across platforms, across applications, and hence they are easy to share. Now, what is the disadvantage of a RAW file? Uh, when it comes straight out of the camera, RAW files look rather dull because uh, the power of editing a RAW file is in your hands. Whereas, like I said, JPEG files uh, are processed in camera 
uh, and when they come out, they come out looking good. But if you expect to do further processing on a JPEG, then you can expect the image quality to degrade. Now, in technical terms, a JPEG is actually a compressed file format. A lot of information is discarded when the camera converts uh, an image to the JPEG file format, which is why it does not uh, take on uh, image editing uh, very well. The image quality degrades. In fact, the image quality degrades every time you save a JPEG file. Now, this degradation of quality might not be very obvious when you uh, look at this photo using a small device like a mobile phone. But if you blow up your uh, image or if you uh, are looking at printing a very high quality image, then definitely you don't want to print a JPEG file, especially one which has been edited a lot. Uh, now, when I say that a RAW file is not destructive, what I mean here is uh, the integrity of the original raw file is never changed, which means that any editing that you do on the raw file, uh, you see the output of that only when you export the raw file either as a JPEG or as other file formats such as TIFF and PSD. Now, TIFF and PSD are file formats which are not, uh, which are non-compressive unlike unlike a jpeg file which is a compressed file format which means a tiff or a pst contains all the original data like a raw file but the original raw file as such cannot be uh, uh, cannot be edited as in you cannot change the integrity of the original raw file whereas when it comes to jpeg like I said, every time you edit uh, a JPEG file or every time you save it, there is some amount of information which is lost. In, in a sense, you are destroying the uh, integrity of the JPEG file. So uh, this concept might be a little uh, difficult to uh, understand right now, but uh, you, when we get on to the uh, Lightroom demo, this, this will be clear. Uh, coming to the file size, because raw files contain all the data that your sensor has captured, raw files are generally much larger than JPEG files. Typically, the size of a raw file is uh, the same as the megapixel of your camera. So if you have a 21 megapixel camera, your raw file will be approximately 21 to 25 megabytes. Whereas a JPEG file is much smaller, and you can also change the resolution of a JPEG file. Uh, so now when you say resolution, it means the length and breadth of uh, the image. Uh, when you reduce the resolution of a JPEG file, then the file size gets smaller. Now, if you're going to view your image in a small screen, uh, like a browser window or your mobile phone, then you don't need the full resolution of the JPEG file, which means you can actually output a smaller resolution of the JPEG file. Now, uh, all this apart, it is uh, certainly not a bad thing to shoot only JPEG. So it totally depends on the situation. For example, if you need to quickly uh, give what you've shot to your client or to someone who's been waiting for your photos, then it's perfectly okay to shoot JPEG. But just understand that for the purpose of this webinar and for the purpose of Lightroom, we will be uh, working on raw files because that's what gives the best quality when you edit. The next difference and a common question which people ask is Photoshop versus Lightroom. So Photoshop has been around since 1990 and uh, Photoshop is a pixel editing and manipulation software for standalone files. Now, uh, you work on only one file at a time in Photoshop, unlike in Lightroom where you import a lot of photos and work on them. So this concept, again, we will see in the demo. Uh, but it's important to note that in Photoshop, you work on the individual pixels or uh, it's a pixel editing software and you can do a lot of photo manipulation, like you can add stuff, you can remove stuff, which you technically can't do in, a, uh, in Adobe Lightroom because it's more about organizing, uh, saving, viewing, tagging, editing, etc. And it works well with a large number of files when you have a batch of files. And uh, Lightroom has been around since 2007. Now you can open a raw file in Photoshop. It opens in what is known as ACR. ACR stands for Adobe Camera Raw. So this is a plugin 
2 Photoshop and it is uh, it is the same engine which runs behind Lightroom as well. So although the UI between Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom might be different, the controls are all the same and the way they treat the raw file is all the same. So you could work on a raw file in Photoshop as well in Adobe Camera Raw. You will see the same set of controls maybe maybe arranged differently. That's it. So here is a quick feature comparison, comparison between Photoshop and Lightroom. Uh, both software are intended for raw editing, um, but like I said, Photoshop is also intended for image manipulation and it's a pixel-based image editing software. Uh, Photoshop has absolutely no batch editing capabilities unless you use it with something like Adobe Bridge, but let's not get into Adobe Bridge. Let's focus only on Lightroom and uh, it also has no photo organization features whereas Lightroom uh, is focused more on batch editing fo uh, photo organization etc a common question that people have is how do i know what to edit and by this by by this i mean how do i know uh, what to do with a photo once i've taken the photo and this is where the concept of the histogram is very important. If you've never seen a, a histogram before, then I suggest you turn on that option in your camera. Both your camera and Lightroom have an option to display a histogram. A histogram is nothing but a graph of the distribution of pixels uh, in, in the photograph. So in this particular photograph, if you look at the graph, there are more pixels towards the left than towards the right. And a histogram is typically divided into uh, shadows, midtones, and highlights. Shadows here refers to the darker portion of the image and highlights refers to the brighter portion of the image. So what this histogram is telling me is that this image has more pixels which is on the darker side and whatever is in the uh, middle is the midtones. So in technical terms, the dark pixels are known as shadows, the bright pixels are known as highlights and the middle pixels are known as midtones. So it's very important to keep an eye on the histogram because the histogram tells you how much to edit and if a photo needs editing at all. <clears throat> so um, turn on the histogram in your photo and certainly look at the histogram when you edit your photos in Lightroom. Uh, another important use of the histogram is that when you take a photo and you view it on the back of your camera, when you chimp, when you look at the LCD screen, what your LCD screen might, shows might not be the uh, correct exposure of the photo because the LCD screen brightness actually varies depending on the ambient light. So if it is very dark around you, the LCD screen tends to brighten up, which means that even a dark image might look very bright on the LCD screen. Whereas if you turn on the histogram feature and if you look at the histogram uh, in the on the back of your LCD, then you get a more accurate representation of the exposure of your uh, photo. And based on this accurate representation, Presentation, you can either take another exposure after you brighten or uh, darken the exposure. So a histogram is a very important tool for photographers. In the demo, we will be looking at more examples of uh, different photos and how the histogram of these photos look like. So stick around for the demo. The next question that get that I get asked is, how do I know how much to edit? Uh, for many people, the image on the left might be enough, but uh, some of us might want to push it a little further, might want to edit a little further. So I've uh, brightened up some of the dark portions in this image. I've saturated the greens and I've done a little bit of more editing. So this question, uh, can be answered only by you, which means it's purely based on your intention, your skill, your patience level. So how much to edit a photograph is uh, solely dependent on the photographer. So this is where the artist in you comes out and this is where your skill in using software like uh, Lightroom or Photoshop comes into play. So I'm gonna pause here 
and take some questions. Um, let me just quickly browse through the chat window and see what questions people have. Okay, I see a lot of highs and hellos. I don't see too many questions. So if there are questions, please type them out so I can answer. Questions, questions, questions. I'm waiting for questions. All right. Looks like there are no questions, so let's move on. Next, we're going to look at some examples of image editing. So I have this image of a kite and I'm going to walk you through some of the basic image editing steps uh, that I've performed So the first step that I've uh, done here is to crop the image. So cropping can be for a couple of reasons. One is you crop if you want to zoom into the image. Two, you crop if you want to exclude something from your composition. Three, you can crop to change the aspect ratio. So there are a couple of reasons to crop. So in this example, I have cropped the image uh, to change the aspect ratio. So cropping is one step. The second step is brightness adjustment. So you can either increase the brightness or decrease the brightness. In this example, I have increased the brightness so you can see uh, some of the darker areas of the bird better. The third step is contrast, contrast adjustment. Now one thing to note is that um, these changes might be very subtle. You might actually not see a lot of drastic changes, but there are changes. So contrast adjustment is again something that you would do to uh, uh, you know, change the overall histogram. So we will look at examples of that as well. But once you make your contrast adjustment, you can move on to saturation. So if you look at this image, the greens and the blues and the browns are a little more saturated. Now again, saturation is purely personal taste. So there is no um, specified limit to how much you can saturate. Moving on, noise reduction. So this image was shot at an insanely high ISO. So there's a lot of digital noise. And this digital noise is in the form of colored uh, noise uh, and also uh, non-colored luminance noise. So these are two different kinds of uh, noise patterns. And I've applied some noise reduction and most of the noise has gone away. Now, uh, one thing to note is that your camera might also have a noise reduction option. I would suggest to turn it off. Anyway, the noise reduction option in the camera might, uh, you know, only, it, would, it would only delay your uh, shooting time. So turn it off, definitely turn off high, high ISO noise reduction uh, in the camera. When you shoot raw, you can do all the noise reduction in your software. So after noise reduction is sharpening. Now again, this is a very subtle change, but if you actually look at the eye of the bird, and if you look at the feather, there is some amount of sharpening that has been applied. Now, since this is a heavily cropped image, and since this was shot at a very high ISO, uh, the image was not very sharp to start off with. So the uh, conditions that you shoot in, the kind of lens that you shoot in also matters. And finally, you can uh, get creative. You can convert your image to black and white. You can grade your image based on your artistic intent. Uh, 
and this is definitely uh, one of the basic steps of image editing so in this photo i have taken the final uh, edited image and i have converted it to black and white uh, and i've done so mainly because i was not too happy with the background i was not happy with the blue in the background because it was a building it was artificial so to highlight the bird to highlight its eye to highlight its feathers i converted the image to black and white so uh, this is again purely artistic intent you can uh, choose not to convert your image to black and white or you can choose to grade it differently so these are some of the most basic image editing steps another step which uh, some people miss out on is white balance adjustment so in very layman terms white balance is the color temperature or the color cast of an image and this color cast generally happens when you shoot indoors or when you shoot under artificially colored light uh, a very uh, common example is in a wedding so the video guys go around with this bright yellow light and uh, that ends up making all your photos look horribly yellow so in in technical terms we say that the photo is too warm because it's too too yellow and you can correct the white balance easily in lightroom especially when you shoot raw so in this particular image which was shot indoors uh, i know that the light the white balance was off because the color of the cat's uh, hair was definitely not this yellow i know that the cat has more white hair so i could easily uh, adjust the white balance of this image sometimes it might be difficult to adjust a white balance because you might not have a reference so we will also look at how to deal with that in lightroom so those were some of the basic steps of uh, image editing what are the advanced steps so all the steps that we have seen so far are global corrections which means that they affect the overall image uh, but you might want to make more localized corrections which means you might want to uh, edit only specific parts of an image so lightroom has some wonderful tools for localized correction and in fact uh, to be able to uh, edit an image in a more locus localized way is what sets uh, a good photo editor from a normal photo editor the next two corrections lens profile correction and geometric correction are mostly based on the kind of lens that you use so an example of uh, geometric correction is when you shoot with a fish eye lens so for example a gopro lens gives a fish eye effect and you might want to defish that effect you might want to make it look more natural so then you would do a geometric correction or if you're shooting uh, a building and the lines are not straight and the, the lines are looking like they're falling over the building looks like it's tilting then you can make a geometric correction lens profile correction is generally applied uh, to uh, nullify some of the faults in a lens so lenses are not perfect they come with various kinds of uh, defects uh, for example purple fringing aberrations uh, vignetting etc so you can edit all of these with one click by using a lens profile a lens profile is generally supplied by uh, adobe so if you use a very standard lens a very popular lens then you might most likely find a built in profile for that lens in lightroom so lens profile and geometric uh, correction uh, are mostly for lenses the next thing that you could do is you could merge three or more exposures and create a high dynamic range or hdr image now high dynamic range imaging is very important when you do interior photography or you do outdoor photography because uh, normally camera sensors cannot uh, cannot capture the brightest and the darkest areas of a scene unlike our eyes so our eyes when we step out it can gather so much data that we can look at the sky we can look at some dark areas under a rock and we can see everything uh, evenly whereas a camera tends to make sacrifices either your highlights are blown out which means your highlights or your uh, the the bright areas of your image are totally white or the dark areas of of your image are totally black both of which may not be the correct representation of the scene so that's when you bracket your image you take three or more exposures and then you merge them into an hdr image 
the next advanced uh, step that you can perform is create a panorama so you can again merge multiple images and create a panor panorama now a pano generally gives you a wider field of view than what you could have shot uh, with that lens as a single image so both hdr and panorama requires you to uh, shoot specific uh, shoot in a specific way in the field so only when you shoot in a specific way in the field can you bring these images into lightroom and perform an hdr or panorama action the next thing is presets now presets uh, they are very popular even with mobile phones you can just apply some filters and edit uh, the look of an image but you can also create your own filters in lightroom and apply these filters for quick editing and quick editing and batch editing are two strengths of lightroom okay so looks like we have some questions in uh, the chat let me just scroll through the questions and i've also got some text messages on my mo mobile phone so let me quickly just take a look at that as well so hi hello hi hello which is high tones mid tones and low tones are they the same as highlights and shadows uh, so this is a good question i have uh, lots of examples in the lightroom demo where i will show you different types of images and we will look at the histogram and we will try and identify the highlights shadows and mid tones when you say the image is over processed so again, typically one way of uh, saying that an image is over is by looking at the histogram. There is something known as clipping. Clipping means that your highlights are too much to the right uh, or your shadows are too much to the left. They are going beyond the graph. So this is definitely one way of identifying that um, you know, your image is over -processed. Or if your colors are too saturated or your contrast is too much, then you can say that the image is over -processed. Now, one important thing to note here is the image might not look the same on different devices. So the image might look one way on your monitor. The image might look slightly different when you see it on your mobile phone or when you see it on a different person's monitor. And this is because not all devices are calibrated the same way. Not all screens are calibrated the same way. So uh, when you look at an image, when you want to evaluate if an image is correctly processed or not, I would recommend doing it on a good monitor, a good screen, preferably one which is calibrated. Okay, Madhu Reddy asks, when can I use vignette option? Uh, we will look at an example of that. Example for HDR image. All right, that's coming up in the demo. Need more details about histogram. Again, coming up in the demo with examples. Now I'm learning nature and landscape photography. In which mode should I apply, whether RAW or JPEG? So definitely shoot in RAW. That's what I've been telling right from the beginning of this webinar. A RAW file is definitely a better option because it has all the uncompressed data from the sensor. Please open the Lightroom and show live editing if possible. Yes, Srinivas, that's coming up next. While editing on a certain display, it doesn't look the same on a mobile phone. Uh, like I said, not all devices are calibrated the same way. So definitely there will be a variance from one device to another. Uh, if your ultimate goal is to print an image or if your ultimate goal is to um, view an image on a browser then definitely use a calibrated screen and edit your image on a calibrated screen now how do you calibrate a monitor there are uh, devices hardware devices for that there are also some software devices but a hardware solution is definitely better so these are some things that uh, you know i demonstrate in my lightroom hands-on workshop so i actually show how to calibrate a monitor it's not possible to show it in this webinar I think those are the questions. Let me check my messages to see if there are more questions. Okay. So it looks like I've addressed most of the questions. 
so before we jump into the demo, um, just a quick note that I'm going to use Lightroom Classic, which works on a computer. If you're looking at editing photos on a mobile, then uh, this might not be for you. And Lightroom is for people who are looking at uh, the best possible output from their raw file. So you need time and patience to import, organize and edit images. Okay, looks like there was another question about curves. Uh, okay, let me demonstrate curves when I open Lightroom. So bear with me, I'm going to switch screens. I'm going to switch applications. So this might take a moment. All right, I hope all of you can view my desktop. This is a Mac computer, uh, but Lightroom is going to look exactly like this, even on a Windows PC. Uh, this is how it would look before you even start using Lightroom when you just open up Lightroom. I have a few extra uh, plugins here. You can ignore those, but I don't have any images imported and I'm in the library module. So the Lightroom demo is going to be divided into two parts. First is we're going to talk about how to use the library module. So this here is the library module. And next we will look at how to use the develop module. And the develop module is where you edit images. And then we will look at how to export images. We're going to skip map, book, slideshow, print and web. Uh, because we don't have time to cover all that. And anyway, those are slightly advanced things, which even I don't use because I don't use, I don't publish to a book, I don't publish to a slideshow, and I very rarely print from Lightroom itself. So we will focus more on the library and develop module. So uh, before we import images into Lightroom, I quickly want to uh, highlight how Lightroom works. So Lightroom works differently from other software. For example, if I take Photoshop, so I'm going to quickly fire up Photoshop. In Photoshop, I would open a single image and edit it, all right? So I would choose something from my desktop and I would edit the image, save it. Whereas that's not how Lightroom works. So in Lightroom, you import images. And once you import an image, you don't have to save your edits. So all the edits are automatically saved. And after you edit an image, you have to export the image. So remember in the beginning, I mentioned that the integrity of a raw file is never changed, which means that all the edits that you make inside Lightroom does not actually change the raw file itself. These edits are applied onto Lightroom and onto the raw file in Lightroom and you export the image as a JPEG, TIFF, PSG when you hit the export button. So now that we know how Lightroom works, the philosophy of Lightroom, let's import some images. So there is an import button here. You can click the import button. That's one way of importing an image or you could open your images. Right now I have a set of raw files which are in these folders. I can drag and drop these images to Lightroom. Now when I click import and select my images or when I drag and drop these images into Lightroom, I get the screen and this is known as the import dialog box. The import dialog box is what controls how you import images into Lightroom. And what's important to note here is that there are a couple of options here. The first option says copy as DNG. DNG is Adobe's proprietary RAW format. So you could convert 
the raw file which you have shot either either Canon, Nikon or Sony camera, you could convert it to DNG. In fact, all the raw files that are there in this example are DNG files. Uh, but that's not an option that I generally use, so you can skip that. More importantly, you can choose whether you want to copy your images or add your images. And what copy does is that uh, it moves your images from sorry it makes a copy of the image from one location to another so this is what you would typically use if you were to import images from your sd card or your cf card directly so you would plug in your uh, card your memory card into your computer and this import dialog would come and then you would say copy your image so when you copy your image your uh, source is on the left your destination is on the right. So you're basically instructing Lightroom to copy images from your source to your destination and also import the images to the catalog. Whereas now we won't do any copying because uh, the images are already on my computer. Nor will I do any moving. I will be adding the images to my catalog. All right. So you could uh, do a couple of things here. You can check all, you can uncheck all, you can select which image you want to uh, import. So those are a couple of things that you can do. I'm going to import all my images. So I'm going to say check all and I'm going to hit import. Now what's going to happen is that the images are going to get imported into the catalog. Now what is a catalog? A catalog is a database and this is like the database where all the instructions that you apply to a raw file are stored so all your metadata tagging your organizing your stars your editing all that information is stored in the lightroom catalog now typically you need only one catalog for all your images the catalog sits in your my pictures folder uh, you can actually create a new catalog you can open a catalog uh, you can do a lot of things, but generally working with one catalog is enough. And what Lightroom has done now is it has imported these images into the catalog, which means that now my Lightroom catalog knows that these images exist on my hard drive. And uh, I have not created duplicate copies. I have only uh, imported the images into the catalog. Now, if I look uh, on the left, I have this uh, window which says catalog so it's showing me all the images that I've imported and as my previous import so there are 34 images if I want to look at the folders where the images lie then I come here so Mojave PCIe is the hard disk on which these images lie and these are the folders in which these raw files exist on my hard drive so the folder structure is maintained inside Lightroom and if you want to look at the images then you can look at the folder structure here. That is, if you want to look at all your all the images in your catalog, then you can go to all photo fo all photographs here in the catalog window. All right. Now we are in the library module, where we edit image is the develop module. So I can look at this view, which is the grid view, or I can look at a single image, which is the loop view. In the loop view, I see only one image at a time. In the grid view, I see all the images in my catalog at once. And below, I have something known as a film strip. So again, the film strip displays all the images that are in my uh, catalog. So when I'm looking at a single image, so I can double click on this image. When I look at this image, I can still move to another image from my film strip, which is on the bottom. Now, all these panels, the left panel, the right panel, and the bottom panel, can be opened or closed. So there are these small triangles you can open and close so you can maximize your real estate. And to go back to the grid view, you could click here. To view an image in the loop view, you could click here. Or you could use the shortcut keys. So G is a shortcut key for grid view. And double clicking on an image opens up the image in the loop view. All right, and the most important thing is the histogram. The histogram is here on the top right, uh, but you also have the histogram once you move to the develop module. So let's quickly look at what you can do in the library module. So what is the purpose of the library module? So if you finished the first step, which is importing images, now we have imported the images. Now in the li li uh, library module, you could 
uh, rate your images. You could rate them with uh, a rating of one to five, or you could give them stars, one star, two star, three star, four star, and five star, or you could give them color codes. For example, this image has a yellow color code. So these three ways of uh, tagging your images with uh, ratings, with stars or with color code makes it very easy for you to uh, quickly filter out images in the grid view. The other way you could uh, filter out images is by using flags. So there are three flags, unflagged, rejected and flagged. Now flags uh, are something which even I don't use very often. So we can skip flags, but let's look at how to uh, rate or rank or color code your photos. So the simplest way to do that is to select a photo and hit the numbers one to five. So if I hit one on my uh, keyboard, I can see that this photo has been rated one. The other way I could do it is right click, go to set rating and give a rating of one. I could, I could also give a rating of two, uh, three, four, five. So I could give any star rating. The next option is the color option. So I can give a color code, like I can give red, I can give uh, green, yellow, blue, purple, etc. Now why it is useful to color code or give uh, star ratings is you could quickly filter your images in the library. So the way to filter images is to go to attribute. So when you hit attribute, you get this small toolbar on top and using this toolbar, you can quickly uh, filter out your images. So here it says that when the rating is equal to or greater than three stars, the images should be displayed over here. Unfortunately, I don't have anything that is three star or greater, so it is not displayed here. But I have images which are one star uh, or equal to one star, so I can quickly filter out my images in the grid view. So nothing's happening to the images in the hard disk. It's just that in the grid view, the images are either filtered out or all of them are shown. Similarly, you could also filter out images by the color code. So it says show photos with the yellow label. So if I click on this, only those photos which have a yellow label are displayed. And uh, I could also show all the photos that have no color label. So unlabeled photos with a rating of one. So this is cumulative. So now it's taking an instruction that show all photos which have a rating equal to greater than one star and which don't have a color code. If I remove this one star, it's going to show me all the images which are not uh, color coded. So there are different ways in which you could use this color coding and star rating. And like I said, the flags are also here. Uh, so one example of where you would use this is suppose you come back from a shoot and uh, you have edited uh, say 10 photos you have shot 50 photos but you've edited 10 photos you could give uh, a color code or a star rating for, for those 10 photos so when you want to go back and look at which are the 10 photos you have processed you can quickly filter out those images in the grid view using the attribute option on top and at any time, if you if you think that your grid view is not showing all your images, then go and check if any of these attributes are checked. Now, I quickly, uh, I briefly spoke about flags. So the most important flag is the rejected flag. So again, imagine you come back from a shoot, you've shot like uh, 100 photos, and out of 100 photos, maybe 10 photos are not good. They are blurred, uh, or they are underexposed, and you want to delete them. So a very quick way of uh, looking through your photos and selecting which ones you want to uh, delete is by using the arrow key. So you can scroll to the left, right, up, down, using the arrow keys. And when you come across a photo that you don't like, that you want to delete later on, you can just hit the X key on your keyboard. So when you hit the X key, this image is set as rejected. So once you have gone through all your images and you've rejected all the bad images, you could go to photo, delete rejected photos, which means that in one shot, you can delete a lot of photos that you have rejected. And once you delete all these photos, uh, they are either removed from the catalog or they're deleted from the hard disk. Now, this is a very important distinction because remember I said, uh, deleting uh, 
I mean, remember I said that the photos are imported into the catalog. When they're imported into their into the catalog, uh, you have an option of either removing them from the catalog or deleting them forever from the hard disk. So make this choice wisely and decide whether you want to remove it from the catalog or delete from the hard disk. So right now I'm not going to remove anything. And then you have the option of uh, adding keywords. So once you add keywords, you can quickly search using the keywords by uh, uh, opening the text option here. And then once I have uh, set a keyword, like so if I have a keyword that says wedding, then I can quickly search by that keyword. But then you have to make the effort to actually keyword your photos manually. So this is where you would keyword your images. And there are some keyword suggestions that Lightroom builds as you keep adding more and more keywords. And then the metadata. So if you want to look at the EXIF of your image, you can quickly see the EXIF over here. So it tells you which camera it was shot with, which lens, uh, what are the, uh, what is the aperture, what is the shutter speed, ISO, etc. So this is this is the most important. Uh, these are the most important panels in the library catalog. So I'm going to quickly pause before I move on to the develop uh, module. And if you have questions, please type them out. I'm quickly scrolling to see if there are questions. Okay. So uh, a common question that people are asking is if this session can be viewed again. Yes, you can view it again. It's going to be there in my YouTube channel. You can uh, come back later and view it. And uh, Manjunath wants to know if you can demonstrate the Orton effect. Now the Orton effect cannot be done in um, Lightroom. It is a Photoshop effect. You can get something close to the Orton effect in Lightroom, but if you want a pure Orton effect, you have to do it in Photoshop. And we're not going to cover Photoshop in this session. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any more questions on the library module. So let's go to the develop module. and. We will start by looking at different examples of histogram. So for that, I'm going to go into the folder which has all the uh, different kinds of photos with different kinds of histogram. And uh, I'm going to go through each photo individually. And I want you to keep an eye on the histogram on the top right here. So the first photo. So in this photo, you can see that most of the pixels are towards the left. And why is that so? It's because this photo was taken with a black background. So the background in this photo is very black and that is why most of the pixels is on the, are on the left. Uh, we'll come back to this photo later. And if you see this photo, there is a, a distribution of pixels on the left and a small amount of distribution of pixels on the right and barely anything in the middle. So the pixels on the right correspond to this area of the image and the pixels on the left correspond to the bottom half of the image, which is fairly dark. Whereas if you look at this image, it is even more darker and hence uh, the pixels are actually going beyond the left of the histogram. So this is what we call as clipping, which means that this image is too underexposed. Whereas if you look at this image, it has too many pixels to the right, which means that this image is overexposed. So this portion of the histogram corresponds to the sky area, which is too bright. So by looking at the histogram, you can make out if an image is properly exposed or underexposed or evenly exposed. This is another example where the background is dark and your main subject is just a thin piece of illuminated moon. And if you look at the histogram, there is barely any spike in the distribution of pixels. Most of the spike is towards the left because uh, the background was dark and there's a small amount of pixel distribution uh, towards the right, which corresponds to the moon. So looking at these different examples, what I would like to point out is that 
there is no right or wrong histogram in the sense there is no perfect histogram it all depends on what you want to shoot for example if i want to shoot a scene like this then definitely this histogram is telling me that this image is overexposed or this image is underexposed but this image is evenly exposed i can recover some of this uh, dark areas in lightroom or i can bring down the bright areas in lightroom but for most part the pixel distribution in this image is fair is more, uh, more or less okay whereas if you look at this image although most of the pixels are towards the left i cannot claim this image to be underexposed that is because this image was in, intended to have a black background similarly this image was intended to have a black background and because the moon is a very small portion of the entire frame that is why there are very few pixels towards the right now a unique form of pixel distribution is this where there is a gap either on the left or the right or both sides now this gap says that this is a low contrast image so this was shot uh, on a very foggy morning in the taj mahal uh, there was a lot of haze and uh, fog and when it's hazy and when it's foggy you tend to you generally tend to have a very low contrast image now how do you identify if a image has low contrast is by looking at the gap so if there is a gap on the left or the right then you can uh, say that the image has low contrast now again it's difficult to uh, take a proper exposure of this photo in the field because if you increase your exposure compensation then your pixels are going to go off on the right as it is you can see that some of the pixels are going too much to the top or if you underexpose then you might end up having too much of gap towards the right so these scenes are difficult to shoot so again when you edit you have to keep in mind that this was a low contrast scene because it was a foggy morning okay quickly uh, pausing for questions on histogram uh go ahead feel free to type your questions um i will take them up later i'm going to give a 2 minute break uh in this 2 minute break i'm going to have some water because i've been talking for an hour now all right now that we've seen okay achuta has a question which lens can we use in landscape or nature so landscape and nature are very broad genres so when you say landscape it could mean uh, a lot of things when you say nature it could mean a lot of things for example macro photography is part of nature uh, astro photo photography is part of uh, landscape so your question has to be a little more specific okay let's go to the develop module and this is where all the action happens so first i'm going to select an image to edit for which i'm going to go to the basic tonal corrections tab where i have different examples and i'm going to take up uh, i'm going to take up this example here so this is an this is a photo of the night sky this is the milky way these are the stars and i'm going to go to the develop module and i'm going to go to the basic tab so the basic tab is where we do all the tonal corrections all right so you have your exposure contrast highlights shadows whites blacks etc so in the basic module what i want to do to this image is i want to brighten it up so i'm going to move the exposure slider so when i move the exposure slider what i notice is what was dark has become bright and if i revert the change if you look at the histogram all the pixels were bunched up towards the left as i increase the exposure the pixels moved towards the right and the image became brighter so what does the exposure do it either makes the image brighter or darker let's take an example of uh this where the, pic the pixels are towards the right here if i want to uh, decrease the brightness of the image i can move the exposure towards the left and as i move the exposure towards the left i can see that there is color which is coming out in the lake 
So I'm going to revert back. You can see that there was barely any color in this lake, but as I move my exposure slider to the left, there is more color coming out in the lake. And if you look at the histogram, the pixels are also moving towards the left. They were all towards the right, but now they're moving towards the left. So in very simple terms, your exposure slider is how you increase the brightness or the uh, darkness of an image, all right? Now, the problem with the exposure slider is that it is a very high level, very global kind of a change. Uh, let me go back to this example. Let me revert exposure back to zero. And uh, say I want to increase only the uh, dark areas of this image. Now, what do the dark areas correspond to? They correspond to the shadows. So the shadows and the black slider are very specific ways to, to change the exposure in the image. So moving the shadows or the black slider affects only the left part of the histogram. So let's see that when I increase the shadows and when I increase the blacks, you can notice that only the dark area of the image is getting brightened. The sky is not getting brightened at all. So this is a very quick way of editing an image uh, by moving only the shadows. Now, one important point to note here is why we stress that the, uh, the exposure has to be right in the camera and it's important to look at the histogram is when you do these kind of edits, when you push the shadows or the highlights uh, too much, you will end up getting noise. So if you see, there is not so much noise in the sky, but because I pushed my shadows too much to the right, you can see how much of noise is there in this image. That is why it is important to get the exposure right in your in the camera and a quick way of reverting these changes back to the midpoint is to double click on the slider it comes back to the midpoint let's look at another example uh, let's look at this example now in this example there is actually a mountain a snow clad mountain way in the back uh, but when i'm looking at it like this it's not very obvious because uh, of uh, the haze and because there are pixels to the right. So if I edit this image, if I decrease my exposure, although the, the shape of the mountain is getting better, there is more color in, uh, in the buildings, the sunrise colors, this part of the image is getting dark. So instead of using the exposure, I'm going to decrease the highlights. And if required, I'm going to decrease the whites. So what that has done is it has given me a more balanced image where the dark portion of the image is not affected, whereas the sky is affected and uh, a certain part of the image which was not very prominent earlier is now prominent. Okay, I'm going to revert these changes back by double clicking on them. And uh, if you need to know which part of the image these sliders affect, you can take your cursor here. And if you can see below the histogram, it says blacks. If I move the cursor a little to the right, it says shadows. Similarly, if I move to uh, the right, it says highlights, and here it says whites. What it means is these sliders affect these parts of the histogram, which is why I've been stressing right from the beginning, always keep an eye on your histogram as you edit your images. Here is another image. This already has some settings applied. I'm going to reset these uh, settings by clicking on reset and you can make out a drastic change before and before it was edited and after this, after it was edited. Now it is important to note that this is an edited image. When I reset, it goes to the unedited state and you can see that in the unedited state, there was barely any color. The foreground was too dark. It was looking too bland and this is typically how your raw files come out of the camera. So what I did for this image was I increased the shadows to bring out the color in the grass. I decreased the highlights a little to bring out some of the color in the sky. And then I increased the contrast. So increasing the contrast uh, gives a good separation between your shadows and your highlights. And then I went and increased my vibrance and saturation. Now, what is the difference between vibrance and saturation? Both these colors affect, sorry, both these sliders affect the colors. The difference is that 
your vibrance is a very subtle change. I'm going to revert this back to zero. You can notice that even when I push the vibrance slider all the way to the right, when I even when I touch 83, the image does not look very bad. But if I bring vibrance to zero and I push saturation to 83, you can see that the image starts looking a little weird. This this portion has become too yellow. So vibrance and saturation works differently. Uh, vibrance is a very controlled way of increasing the saturation in your image. Again, uh, a good example would be to see a portrait which has skin tones. So if I increase the saturation, even the skin tones get affected. Whereas if I increase the vibrance, the skin tones are not so much affected as the other portions of the image. So these are some examples of how you would uh, use the uh, tonal sliders. Uh, let's quickly look at one more example. Let me take this example. So in this example, I want the uh, B the body of the B to be more prominent. So I'm going to increase the shadows. And when I increase the shadows, the B kind of gets washed out. So I'm going to increase the contrast a little. And because uh, the background is white, I can also play around with the highlights and see if uh, it makes the image pop out a little more. So this is the before and after. So to see the before and after, you can select this option on the left. I mean, sorry, on the bottom left, you can see a before and after using this split screen or using the same screen. So the different ways you can toggle and see the before and after. Note that all these changes that I made has not affected the histogram in the sense there is no clipping towards the right or the left. Uh, let's take this example. Again, this is an edited image and this has a good pixel distribution throughout the histogram. I'm going to reset the image and you can see that uh, the histogram looks great, but the image was looking a little bland. Whereas this edited image is popping out. The subject is popping out. The colors are popping out. The blues are looking pleasing. So these are the kind of edits that you need to make to enhance your image. Again, this image, uh, this was shot in Iceland. Um, so this is an image where, you know, the sky is washed out. So there was no cloud. There were no clouds in the sky. The sky was bland. So decreasing the highlights is not going to give me a lot of detail in the, in the sky. So I'm not going to bother too much with the sky, but I'm going to increase my contrast. And when I increase my contrast, the separation between the rocks, uh, this uh, small hut and the grass, uh, or the foliage increases. Similarly, when I increase the saturation, the grass pops out. So this is the before and after. You can see that just by moving the uh, couple of sliders, I have enhanced this image. So sometimes subtle changes are all that are required uh, and always keep an eye on the histogram when you make these changes. Okay, I'm gonna quickly pause for questions before I move on to dehaze. I'm going to look at dehaze, clarity, and texture. But before that, I'm going to quickly pause for questions. Okay, so Jyoti wants to know how can uh, how can you say whether the image is over or underexposed looking at the histogram? Okay, Jyoti. So let me take an example of an overexposed image. So if you look at this histogram, the pixels are too much to the right. And if I go to the develop module and I click on this little triangle, it's going to show me the areas which are overexposed. So this red overlay that you see here, which comes up when you turn on this triangle here, it's showing the areas which are clipped. So this image is overexposed. I can say that by looking at the histogram or I can turn on clipping. Similarly, this image is underexposed. I can turn on clipping and it's showing me the areas that are underexposed. And overexposure and underexposure, what it means is that the pixels to the right have become white 
and the pixels to the left have become black. And when you have pure white and pure black, you can't have detail. And what you want is detail in every pixel in your image. Okay, the next question, Manjunath wants to know about profiles. So down here in the develop module, you have something known as uh, calibration and you have something known as profile here. So these two are kind of interrelated. So what a profile is uh, or what it does is basically it applies a pre-decided uh, set of uh, colors or it's a way of interpreting the colors in your image. So if I take this image, how does Lightroom know what shade of green this is? Actually, there's no way of knowing. Uh, it's the profile which tells Lightroom what shade of green this should be. So actually, when I cycle through the profiles, you can see that the shades also change. The shade of green is changing. So some profiles have been created for specific purpose. For example, this is the landscape profile. This is the flat profile. Standard is the flat profile. Then you have vivid. So you have these different kind of kinds of profiles. Okay, next question. Okay, let's move on. Let's look at the dehaze slider. So this image, uh, like I said, was overexposed. I can move the highlights. I can decrease the exposure. But what is still lacking in this image, and that's because it was very hazy that morning, is micro contrast. So that's where this dehaze comes into uh, comes in handy. When I push the dehaze slider, you can see that uh, the haze in the image goes away. And uh, obviously that has also increased the contrast of the image. So I can either decrease the contrast or increase the contrast. But uh, dehaze is an excellent way of removing haze. And haze can happen due to pollution, due to fog, due to different weather conditions. So dehaze is uh, the slider to go to when you have uh, a photo that is either low contrast or it was shot under foggy conditions. Another example of dehaze is when you shoot the Milky Way. So this is uh, the Milky Way photo, but if I want the Milky Way to pop, then I can move the dehaze slider. Obviously, just moving the dehaze slider is not enough. I also have to push the highlights and the white slider to bring out the brightness in the core of the Milky Way. And I can also increase the shadows a bit. So just by moving the shadows, highlights and dehaze slider, I have edited this image. Now if you're interested in astrophotography, please attend my next workshop. Uh, the announcement will come on YouTube, so subscribe to my channel. So that was an example of your dehaze slider. Now let's look at an example of the texture. So I'm going to reset the changes here. I want you to focus on the strands of the web. So the strands of the web, spider web, just take a look at what happens when I move the texture slider. So the strands really stand out. That's because what the texture does is it is targeting the very fine details in an image. Whereas clarity is the opposite. It targets the not so fine parts of the image. So if you look at the body of the uh, spider, it's getting uh, more texture as I move the clarity slider. Let's look at another example. Uh, let's look at this example. So I'm going to zoom in here. And you can see that uh, moving the texture slider is affecting the lines of the building, whereas moving the clarity slider is affecting not the lines, but the sky, because the sky has more uh, larger details and so has the grass. So if you look at the grass, it's getting more affected by the uh, clarity slider than the texture slider. 
So use of texture and uh, clarity comes with practice, especially when you're doing uh, portraits. You may want to increase the texture in the hair, in the eyes, in the skin, etc. Whereas you may not want to increase the clarity and make the image look uh, ugly or the, your subject look ugly. Okay, so you have covered pretty much all the uh, sliders in the develop module. One slider which I have not covered yet is the white balance. So let's look at uh, a photo which has a white balance problem. Um, yeah, this photo. So this has this photo has a white balance problem. I'm going to reset the changes, and uh, if you can see, the skin looks yellowish because this was shot indoors. So I can move the white balance to make the skin look a little natural. So I move the temperature slider either left or right to uh, counteract the cast, the color cast. And if I want to do it in a quick way, I can choose one of these presets. So I can do an auto and uh, sometimes auto works, sometimes auto does not work. In this case, it has not worked great. In this case, uh, let's see what happens. Yeah, so in this case, it has actually removed some of the uh, warm color cast. And again, white balance is to taste. I might want the image to look warm, so I might want to go back and push the slide a little bit to the right. So this is how you change the white balance in an image. So again, here in this image, the Milky Way is looking a little too brown. So I can make the sky look a little cool by moving the temperature slider a little to the left. Now I have uh, a little more realistic color in the sky. So that was about white balance. So we have covered most of the, uh, sorry, we have covered most of the sliders in the basic module. Quickly, I just want to go through the uh, tar target uh, targeted adjustment options here. Remember, I was telling you about the localized corrections that you can make. The tools to make localized corrections are here, and they have their own set of controls, which kind of mirrors the controls here. So whatever you change here, you can also change here, but in a very targeted way. For example, if I want to change uh, the the color or the white balance of only the sky, then I can use this, which is the graduated uh, filter. So I can just pull this from top to bottom and I can change the white balance only in the sky. And what happens is only the area that I have covered with this graduated filter changes uh, based on these settings. So I can even make it very warm if I want, it can make it very cool. And if you can notice the changes are getting affected only where I have drawn the uh, these lines using this graduated filter. So these are advanced things that we don't have time for in this workshop. Okay, so that pretty much covers the important bits. Let's quickly look at uh, noise reduction. Uh, noise reduction, noise reduction. Yeah. So, yeah, this is an example of, uh, which is a good example to correct noise. So when I zoom into the image, I can see a lot of stars. I can also see a lot of digital noise. So to correct noise, I go into the detail tab. And the way I uh, correct noise is I move the luminance slider. So when I move the luminance slider, I can see that the noise is going away. At one point, the noise goes away and even the stars start looking very dull or they start losing their sharpness. And that is where I stop. So I can stop at say about 36. This is a point where the noise has gone away, but the stars are still sharp. And I can add some detail to the stars by moving the detail slider to bring back some of the sharpness. So this is something that you do by uh, viewing the image at 100% by zooming in. Similarly, I can apply some sharpness to bring back a little bit of pop in the sky. And uh, the problem with sharpness is that it's global. So if I want the sharpness to uh, target only the uh, stars, I can hold my Alt I can hold my option key and click the masking slider, move the masking slider. So what this is showing is 
the areas that are white are affected by the slide uh, the sharpness slider whereas the areas that are black are not affected by the uh, sharpness amount slider so you hold the option key or the alt key and you move the masking till uh, one such point where the sharpness is affecting only those parts of the image that you want the sharpening to be applied to okay so that was about noise reduction and sharpening i'm going to quickly pause and take questions so i have a question about example for hdr image okay so let's look at an hdr image so that earlier photo that i had shown you or oh, let's look at this image all right so this image is uh, bracketed these three images are sorry not this image this image these three images so these three images were bracketed which means that they were taken at three different exposures now the problem of doing a single exposure here is the sky is blown out if i reduce the highlights in the sky i don't really get the sun the sun is not looking like a ball ball i cannot recover the sun when i uh, decrease the exposure so what i did was i took three different exposures and each exposure is for a specific part of the image now to create an hdr out of this i select all three i right click and i say photo merge edit sorry photo merge hdr and when i click this Lightroom is going to show me a preview of the merged images. So this is a preview of the merged images, and you can see how beautifully uh, this image has a very good distribution of uh, exposure. I can see the buildings, I can see the rock, and I can see the sun, which I couldn't see earlier. So if I hit merge, uh, Photoshop is going to create a new file, a new DNG file. and this dng file is my merged hdr and now it has some settings already applied which i can go change based on how i like so i can increase decrease the exposure i can change the saturation i can dehaze it so i can do further edits on this image so that's how you create an hdr image okay do we have more questions uh looks like somebody has a question on photoshop sorry we are not covering photoshop in this webinar or maybe i said photoshop by mistake sorry about that okay so now that we have seen uh, hdr let's look at pano so this again was shot as a pano it was these are three different uh, photos so important difference between pano and hdr is in a pano all your exposures should all your uh, shots should have the same exposure so all these three photos have the same exposure so it's good to take a pano in manual settings whereas in an hdr all three exposures should have different sorry all three photos should have different exposures so this is a these are three individual photos shot for the purpose of the pano so i select all three i right click and i say photo merge panorama so as you can see the merged photo the pano photo actually has a very wide field of view and this is actually three individual images that have been merged so that's how you do a uh, pano okay so we have a question about vignetting and curves so the curves i'm going to demonstrate here so the curves uh are of two types there is a linear curve sorry there is a point curve and there is a uh curve where you have highlights lights darks and shadows what we normally use is the point curve so this is the point curve and some typical curves that we use are the s curve so this is an example of an s curve what the s curve does is basically it uh increases the contrast in the image 
or I can have a matte effect by pushing the uh, leftmost point in the curve. So when I push the leftmost point in the curve, I have a matte effect. I could have a reverse S curve where uh, the shadows are, the point in the shadows are up uh, and the point in the highlights are down. So as you can see, this is this is not a desirable effect, but I'm just going, showing you an example of a reverse S curve. So basically, uh, curves correspond to the histogram and some people prefer using the points on the curve to adjust the histogram. So this histogram and this histogram actually correspond to each other. So some people prefer to use the curve uh, and points on the curve to adjust the histogram or to adjust the tonal settings. Uh, but you could do the same thing using the basic tab. So that's about curves. The other question was about vignetting. So assuming that this is how, okay, this effect is too strong. So I'm going to go back and lower the contrast a bit. Yeah, so let me stop here. So coming to um, vignetting. So the vignetting is under FX. And the easiest way to apply vignetting is to reduce the amount. What happens when I click on vignetting and reduce the amount is the outside area or the uh, areas around the image get darker. And what this does is it puts the focus more on the center part of the image. Let's look at another example. Let's look at this example and let's reduce the uh, amount in the post crop vignetting option. And what it's doing is that it is bringing in focus towards the main subject, which is this Kingfisher. So that's how you increase the uh, or you decrease the vignetting, you could also increase the vignetting and have the opposite effect. So the vignetting is under the FX panel. Okay, so another question is, are all raw images converted to DNG format when imported? Absolutely not. I had shown you that in the import dialog, you have an option of choosing to convert a raw file into DNG. You can do it if you want. I don't do it. I don't really recommend you to do it because then you are going to have uh, raw files on your SD card. You're going to have DNG files on your computer. It's just going to get very confusing. Just keep your raw files in their original format. Uh, so I've covered most of uh, the things that I wanted to cover this. Yes. One more thing that I want to cover was cropping. So let's take this example. So cropping is above the basic panel and uh, I'm going to reset the crop. This was the original crop. And you can see that when I open the cropping uh, dialog box, this is the cropping uh, option. It gives me this grid and it gives me these handles. So there are handles on the edges. There are handles on the sides, on the midpoints of the sides. And what I want to do in this image is I want to bring focus to the subject. I want to take away the distraction on the left. So I drag the handles from uh, one of the corners. I drag the handle and I bring more focus to the subject. And I can move this around if I want with my cursor. But uh, yeah. This is something that I'm happy with. Once I'm happy with this, I click on done. Remember, this is non-destructive. The original photo is not cropped. I can go back anytime and I can change the crop. So when I click on uh, crop overlay, I can go back and crop, change the crop anytime. And there is a lock here. What the lock does is that it maintains the aspect ratio. So most DSLRs shoot in the three is to two aspect ratio, which this lock uh, respects. So when I unlock it, I can change the aspect ratio. I can uh, I can do a custom aspect ratio and I can change it however I, however I want. So you can see I have made it. I have changed it now into this aspect ratio. So you do all that using the crop overlay tool. So that's something I had missed out. So this is a uh, a uh, overview of the develop module. Now comes exporting, exporting to share. So assuming that I have, this is my edited image and I want to share this image, I click on export. 
Now I could click on one image and export it, or I could click on multiple images and export it. So if you look at the film strip in the bottom here, I'm selecting all my images and I can hit export. And now the settings that I change here are going to affect all the images. So remember Lightroom is great for batch editing. So I can batch edit images and then I can export all of them together. For this example, I'm going to click on export for only one image. And this is my export dialog box. So I'm going to close all of these. I'm going to quickly talk about the important options here. So the first is the export location. So remember raw files are not edited per se. They're not, nothing happens to the original raw file, but the edits that you apply to the raw file have to be exported. And you specify the location of the export file uh, here. So you can choose a folder. You can go to your browser, uh, file browser and choose a folder here. You could put the exported files into a subfolder. File naming, you can change the name of the file. So there are some uh, options. You can set up a custom name and a sequence. So you can, I can give a custom name and then the sequence keeps changing automatically. Or I can leave it at a default file name. So there are a lot of options. You can explore these options. Video, we are not looking at video, so we'll skip this. File settings, now this is important. This is where you select your file format. Remember when you export, you uh, depending on what you want to do with the image, you choose the image file format. So 99% of the time you would export these files as JPEG files because you want to share them online. You want to send them as, uh, as attachments. You want to view them in on your mobile. So the most common file format would be JPEG. Now, since JPEG is a lossy file format, you can control the quality or you can control how much of information is discarded. So at 100%, uh, very little information is discarded. I won't say none of the information is discarded, but very little information is discarded. But as I decrease the quality slider, more and more information is discarded, which means the file size becomes smaller and smaller. So 80 is a good number. 80 is a good um, trade-off between file size and image quality. Now image size. Again, image size comes into play only when you export these images in one of these lossy file formats. Suppose I export as a DNG file, then I cannot change the image size option because in DNG is like a uh, raw format where all the information is exported. So let me go back to JPEG and let me select the resize to fit. So what happens here is the width and the height of the image, the final image is constrained to 1500 pixels or 1400 pixels in the height. And the resolution, I would suggest you leave it at 200 or 240. Don't mess around with this. Output sharpening. Now we do some sharpening in the develop module, but every time you export, especially when you resize and export, it is good to apply some amount of sharpening. So here you can select sharpen and you can choose what you're going to do with the outputted image. Suppose you're going to show them, I mean, you're going to view them only on the screen, then you can choose screen and give standard as the option. But if you're going to print the image, then you can choose matte and you can select uh, a low standard or high sharpening that is applied. Or if you're going to print on glossy paper, you can select glossy paper and select the the amount here. But again, 99% of the time, people are going to only view the image. So you can select screen and you can give a standard uh, amount of sharpening. Metadata, we're not going to look at that. Watermarking, we're not going to look at that. You can select a watermark, you can apply a watermark, you can play around with this yourself. Post-processing is nothing but what happens after you exported the file. So after you export, you can open up the location where it was exported to. So it's going to say, it says show in Finder here. So it's going to open up the folder, uh, photo in Finder. It's going to open the exported location. So I'm going to hit export. And it has opened the location and it has exported the file. So this is the file that was exported. And remember, this is a JPG format. and nothing has happened to the original file. I can go back here. I can revert my changes to the original and uh, I can export this as another copy. Uh, so every time I export, I only make copies of the original raw file. So that's very important to understand. So this is the edited image and this is the original image. 
all right so i think we can call it a wrap this is uh, this is a good overview of how to use uh, lightroom to edit images i'm going to pause and take questions now before winding up this webinar okay one question best file format for printing i would say that tiff tiff is the best uh, file format for printing but before you export to tiff speak to your printer and ask your printer if he or she accepts a tiff file for printing because unless you go to a very specialized printer unless you go to a good printer they're not going to accept a tiff file for printing so in that case you will be forced to give a jpeg file more questions do we have more questions so again uh, this recording will be available on my youtube channel feel free to come back go through it uh, it's been almost uh, one and a half hours now since we started so it's a pretty long uh, webinar So we don't have any more questions. So I'm going to end this webinar. Uh, thank you all for joining, and uh, feel free to come back to my YouTube channel. And if you've subscribed to my YouTube channel, you will come to know of the next webinar, which is going to be about astrophotography. And if you follow me on Instagram, uh, Twitter, or Facebook, you can view the announcements for future workshops uh, and tours that I conduct. So let's call it a day. Thank you all for joining. Good night and hopefully see you in the next webinar. Bye-bye.